How's it going, everybody? Josh, Amateur Radio Call Sign KI6NAZ. Thanks for clicking on the Ham Radio Crash Course. I got a couple of hours today, so I'm going to get started on building up my coffee and ham radio antenna. This is an N-fed antenna, meaning the coax connects to this little black plastic winder, and the wire goes whooped all the way out in some direction, some kind of configuration, an inverted V or inverted L or something like that, to the tune of... 62 to 70-ish feet. We're probably going to end up around 62 to 63 feet is my guess once I cut it. So there's two steps, two major steps to this process. It's create the windings for the transformer, which is a toroid that mounts right here. We got to create those windings first per the directions for this antenna. And then we got to go out to the field, run that wire, get it up in the air and start the tuning process. And this is a physical antenna tuning process where I'm going to start folding back the wire until we get the tune where we want it to, that point of resonance. Now, one of the fun things about an NFED half-wave antenna, and, and one of the reasons why they're so popular and people are making them is they're relatively inexpensive and they provide multi-band operation. So I'm gonna be cutting this again, 62 to 64 feet. That's a length of wire that's going to be resonant on 40 meters. That's, we're gonna to get towards 7.07-ish megahertz, right around the FT8 portion. And the bandwidth is gonna be wide enough that I'll be able to get into the voice portion and also have plenty of space in the CW or Morse code portion of the band. Well, as the odd and even harmonics of 40 meters, we're gonna pick up 20 meters, 15 meters, and 10 meters as well. We might pick up a skosh of 12 meters as well, but it's not a big deal. I mainly care about 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters. Those are my primary operating bands. Anyway, enough of my blabbering. Let's go to the tabletop. I'll show you how to build up this transformer. And what I'm gonna be doing with the Coffee and Ham Radio's antenna in regarding its transformer is basically the same construction you would do with other NFED half-wave kits. So if you got Adam K6 ARKs or Jason's KM4 ACKs antenna kit, the fundamentals are going to be the same here. So stay tuned. Now I find NFEDs pretty straightforward and they all pretty much have the same parts. There's usually some kind of mounting bracket, which is this black wire winder. Big shout out to the wire winder though for the coffee and ham radio antenna, it's really nice. But there is a capacitor, a bunch of enamel covered wire, which you can see there in the coil. This kit comes with a BNC connector, but sometimes it's an SO239 connector, a traditional coax UHF connection. And that metallic donut thing at the top there, that's the toroid. And we're gonna use that magnet wire to wrap it up to look a little bit like this. And once we have that done, that's where the magic of the antenna can really happen. Now going back to that B and C, we're mounting this in such a way that we can access both the center pin connector, which is going to be a part of the primary enamel winding, but the coax shield side of the connector is also a part of the transformer, which is all gonna be wrapped and made on top of that toroid, again, that little metallic donut. So we gotta have a good antenna connection there for the feed line. Now this is pretty rigid magnet wire. You can see there, it's got a lot of memory to it. And this is enamel coated. So it doesn't have a traditional rubber jacket or plastic jacket. It's actually like a paint, an enamel. And I'm going in and taking about, it looks like five inches or so, and I'm coiling it over itself. Now this wrap that I'm doing, not required for an NFED half wave, but it's often easiest to describe the image that we are about to start building on the toroid. So regarding wrapping a toroid, every time the wire goes through the center, that is one. So we've already wrapped one, and it's already wrapped through again, that's two. I've now made two wraps through the toroid. And in this case, that is the primary winding for this toroid. The primary being the doubled up pieces of wire that I have twisted together. So again, then completing the second wrap there. And so that's the primary winding. I can then start wrapping that single wire the rest of the way with all those other wraps and that is the secondary winding of the toroid. Now when you get on your eighth turn through the toroid, you're gonna do what's called the crossover and that's where you go across to the other side of the toroid and, and really the purpose of this is so that uh, when you're all done with the wraps, the part of the toroid that connects to the BNC connector is on the opposite side of where the antenna long wire connects into it, which you're gonna see here in a second. Now, the first time you mess around with enameled wire, it can kind of be a pain because you gotta get that enamel off 
to make a good solid electrical connection, particularly in the cases of when you are soldering. There are two methods I like, and this is the first example, first method. Take a lighter, BIC in this case, and some fine steel wool. Heat up that enamel until you basically start seeing the smoke come off of it. Don't breathe the smoke. Then take your steel wool and just pull it off the end of that enameled wire. It should come right off. In this case, this is seriously some beefy wire, and while it, it did clean it up some, I had to go to my second method, which, which also works pretty well. Now, I generally only scrape with the utility knife when I have wire that's pretty thick. In this case, this magnet wire is really, really thick. So taking a utility knife and taking it broadside perpendicular to the side of the wire and just scraping kind of like I'm doing, I'm pushing with my, my offhand thumb there, works really, really well. If this was some fine magnet wire, I definitely would not recommend this method. I would be very, very careful because I have actually just kind of ripped a piece of wire right in half uh, on the thin stuff. Enameled wire can be pretty flimsy. Uh, this is not that case, so just keep that in mind. If you're building the coffee and ham radio antenna, you can largely just use a utility knife if you want to. Now, tying this all together, I think it's pretty straightforward, but we're gonna take our time with this. So. We're gonna make a ring terminal connection. This is like for an automobile connection, and that's gonna connect to one of the primary wrappings on the transformer, specifically the connection that is made to the radial or counterpoise for this antenna. All right, now the other side, as we start to push the primary winding and the other side of the primary into the shield of our BNC connector and the center pin of our BNC connector. And I'm just going through there and making sure we got the anomal all cleaned off of it uh, well enough, but you can see, so center pin goes right in the middle there. And then the side piece is for the shield of the coax. And then obviously that ring terminal, that is where our counterpoise is gonna go. Most kits advocate using a good soldered connection here. I am using the Hako iron, and I am applying a decent amount of heat to do this. This enamel wire, as I mentioned, is no joke. The BNC connector, though, you gotta be careful. You might start seeing that little kind of Teflon um, circle there right by the iron getting a little bit deformed. So you gotta be careful when you're doing this because you can't actually melt your connections there. But it took a really long time just to get the heat built up enough on that connector to really make a solid connection. So take your time with it. If you need to pause because things start getting a little too hot while you're soldering, no big deal, go ahead and do that. Doing a little bit of final fitment here. Just mounting the toroid on the board with the included zip ties. You can see I've already attached the antenna out of the top. That's why we did that crossover loop while we were doing the winding. There is an interesting note though that I need to make sure we hit up. Do you see that capacitor? Yeah, right there, we added a capacitor and that actually jumps the center pin of the BNC connector to the shield and the counterpoise off of that primary winding that we uh, that we had set up in the beginning. That's absolutely required for an N-fed half wave, so make sure you don't forget it. After snipping the leads on my zip ties, the last step is hitting that heat shrink with my heat gun here. I, boy, I really like uh, heat shrink. Is there nothing more satisfying than heat shrink? I don't know, but uh, it's, <laughs> it's really quite satisfying when you got a nice little heat gun and you got some big sheets of heat shrink and this is uh, truly some big sheets of heat shrink. So that's pretty much it. After you get your heat shrink all done, you pretty much have a completed transformer there for your N-fed half wave. Something you might wanna do is a bit of a continuity check on all the points of the transformer. Actually everything from the shield of the coax to the center pin, to the counterpoise, to the long wire should all have continuity with each other. And uh, yeah, that's just kind of how the N-fed half wave works. It's effective, but not a completely perfectly efficient antenna. Uh, some argue a little bit less than that of a dipole. Now, before we go into the field, I thought I'd take a moment and kind of walk through my particular method of tuning some of these antennas. And I've done this in other videos for dipole antennas, you know, two legs with a center fed. I've done other end fed half waves as well, but I've got a nice little setup here that I wanted to talk about. I've got a couple of things that were shipped to me to check out, one being the MFJ. 1914 antenna mast mount. And so this is a plate that sits on the ground and you can see there's these holes. And what you do is you take these stakes and they hammer into the ground and they hold the plate down and you just go around the outside and hammer this thing in place. Uh, this makes for a somewhat, let me, how, how best to explain this? 
your lawn is only going to be as firm a surface as possible. So this is going to have some play to it, particularly if you have a decently sized mast. So if you're planning on putting up something like a, a light Yagi, you probably want to guy it, particularly if you're using something like the mast I have here, which this is the Gigaparts compact mast system. This is the TFA 20 CF. It's about 20 feet tall and you can see how micro, well, how small and compact it packs down into with all these different uh, sections here that are under these toggles. And note on how this works, it's pretty simple. You just pull this out until you get to the red and that's when you stop. So you go back down to the red and you cinch down the toggle and that's all there is to it. They work pretty well. This is probably a little bit bigger than one could put in a backpack because it'd be sticking up pretty high out of your pack, but uh, not something that would be unreasonable to fit in the trunk of your car if you happen to be a POTA car person. You could have a rollover mast stand. You could shove this into it and you'd be really good to go. And then lastly, I'm incredibly honored to be one of the first people in the United States that gets a chance to look at this. This is the Rig Expert Stick 500. Now, there are two sticks in the Rig Expert line of antenna analyzers. There is the Stick 230 and the Rig Expert Stick Pro, which is my personal stick here. You can see they're pretty much the same size. The Stick 230 topped out at 230 megahertz. That's how the names work with Rig Expert. So that meant that you couldn't actually tune up a 70 centimeter antenna. The 500, which is its upgrade to the 230, goes all the way up to 500 megahertz, which means you can tune up 70 centimeter ham radio antennas with it, which is a welcome addition because that basically means the most prominent bands of operation are available in this tiny little unit. It brings back the e-ink display from the 230, which I've always really enjoyed. In daylight, I find that the e-ink, particularly in bright sun, works really well. And to top it off, on the top is an SO239 connector. So that SO239 connector is something that people really like for HF. So that means the cap goes right on top and you're ready to go in the field. Now every coffee and ham radio antenna comes with a packing sheet and that packing sheet has a QR code which takes you to the instructions that tells you what you need to do to tune up the antenna. They give you a lot of wire. I think they give you 90 feet of wire. What you do with that is you roll out 70 feet of it, snip off that remaining 20 so or so feet, and that's gonna be your counterpoise for the antenna. So I'm gonna run out the 70 feet right now, take a snip, and then we're gonna have the two elements to work with on the antenna. Now, I was kind of being a little lazy. I just took a piece of plastic wrap and wrapped up the wire uh, using some gaffer's tape. I already have built this guy, which you saw earlier. And so now we're just gonna get to tuning. I think the best way to do this is I'm gonna walk over there and I'm gonna roll this out, unwrap it with this sitting on the ground. That should keep it still. Hundred foot Amazon tape. I'll post a link in the description. All right, so we need a center mount to connect the wire as we hoist it up. I'm gonna use a bit of this Dyneema ultralight line connected to a S-beaner clip. Nothing fancy, just an overhand loop. And we clip the S-beaner in like that. Now I'm gonna take the end of the wire, which is here, and I'm gonna go that way with it. Use another S-beaner like that. Now there's these holes on the S-clip. We're gonna use that to hold the end tight. All right, now we have the end of the wire here to our transformer. We're going to plug this up to the counterpoise connection here. We are going to run this with a counterpoise, so we'll do that right now. Okay, that's our counterpoise.
All right, we've got the end fed pulled taut. I have the other end of the BNC connected to the antenna analyzer. I'm gonna move the counterpoise behind us. All right, so our first stop, it's 7.1 megahertz set to the middle frequency, and it is too long. So we're gonna take about a half a foot out of it, uh, and we're gonna retest. Okay, so I've unclipped the, the S-beaner here. I'm gonna take half a foot or so out like this. In fact, we, we may go a little bit longer just to speed up the process because I think I'm, I'm way off the band. And then I'm gonna pull the rest through like that. And then I'm gonna feed this through again like that. And for testing purposes, I'm just gonna take the excess and I'm gonna wrap it up around it. All right, I taped up the tag end and we're just gonna hook it back in place and we're gonna retest. Here was our original reading. Let's do that again. Ah, it moved it, but not a whole lot. So it looks like we can get down to 1.3 to 1 on 40. Uh, let's try close. Looks like we need to take another foot out of the uh, out of the link there. I'll do that now. Another foot off the line here. Let's see where we end up. It's only moving a little bit. Ooh, buddy, we just went over. Let's go back to the ham measure here. So we're going to ham now. This should give us the ham bands. <laughs> it's actually uh, really short now. I could I could give it another foot or so on 40. 20 meters. Sorry, a little long on 20 meters. A little short on 15, which is a harmonic of 40 meters. 12, not really 12. That's a CB radio. Let's see what we do on 10. Hey, not bad at all. But that is uh, now going to be short on 10. So um, let's see if we can get it closer in line with 40. So we're gonna we're gonna release some of that line and retest it. So let's go back to. So the dip is towards the high side of the band, which is not really useful for me. So we're gonna, we're gonna give it about a foot back. Oh. Let's test it now. We're going for it. Let's see, do we get it? I don't know. It is starting to rain and that is not a weather sealed lens that's on this camera. So that's not good. I brought the wrong lens, I guess. Uh, I brought a Sigma instead of a Sony lens, and it's beginning to sprinkle, so how about we uh, we make this one adjustment and then we call it a day, all right? Bingo. A little too, a little too short. I'm going to give it back just a little bit, and we're going to call that done, I think. Yeah. Let's give it back a skosh. Oop. Just a bit. So I should mention that uh, as I got a ton of extra wire kind of going back up the side of the radiating element, I did snip it and that actually helped us drop um, the total SWR down, which is kind of what we expected. But here we go, last, uh, last shot. Oh yeah, that's exactly where we want it. Let's see where we're at here. Yep, that'll do. I think we did it, guys. I think we're all set here. Let's try 15. Eh, it's a little short for 15, but not bad. And there's your 10 meters at, eh, we're still under mm, about 1.2 to one for the uh, technician portion, which is where I wanna be for single sideband. So that's it. Awesome. So I want to give a big thank you to Rig Expert for sending me out their new Stick 500. This is, I believe, a semi-final production model. I, I think they're still doing some tweaks to it. So far, it looks like an upgrade to the 230. Literally, what we've talked about with Rig Experts is the number implies the maximum frequency that it works with. 
With a 500, that means you can do all the HF bands and VHF, UHF, two meters and 70 centimeters for you amateur radio operators, particularly the technician class uh, license holders. And another big shout out to Gigaparts for letting me borrow their 20 foot mast here, carbon fiber. I do have the antenna kind of coming away from the mast a little bit. You can see kind of right here, it comes down. And that worked out pretty well. I am using that MFJ mounting system, which is the MFJ 1914. It does have a bit of play. And if you had a much bigger antenna, uh, like if you had a Yagi or something like that, you probably have to guy it. Wire antennas are fine though with this thing. So let's pack it up and get out of here. To wrap things up, to give you guys an idea of, you know, just a reminder of how to get this done. If you want to tune an antenna like an NFED, you want to go to a place pretty much in the open, very low noise, and you want to get the antenna, you know, in the configuration you'd run it. This was obviously in an inverted V setup. If you wanted to throw it over a tree, I suggest throwing it over a tree or an inverted L, right? Coming across and then down, sloper configuration, you get the idea. I will make a recommendation though, that if you want to tune these up easily, the best way to do it is with that end point, somewhere that you can get to it relatively easy. That will make things a lot easier to get tuned up for you when you get out in the field. So keep that in mind. I hope this was helpful. I'm Josh KI6NAZ. Thanks so much for watching and I'll talk to you later. See ya. The nice thing about this coffee and ham radios antenna, if you do want to run a counterpoise, uh, you do have this whole other side here and you can put your radiating element on the other side. So you can see there's like a fat bunch of coils and then a thin bunch of coils on this side. Pretty easy. Lots of mount points for little holes. So you can hoist this up and throw a line into a tree and then run your coax down so there's not a lot of strain on your coax or anything like that. Pretty good stuff. And I will mention a lot of this tuning was made possible by these little magical doohickeys. These are S-beaners. Um, I found out about these from the Pactenna, from George at Pactenna. He wraps all his antennas with these S-beaners, and I have used them to great effect uh, multiple times. So I'm gonna figure out a better solution to keep this all wrapped up, but for now, it's tuned, we're all set. I'll talk to you later, see ya.